Good morning, saints of Hickory Grove. Pastor Eric here to share with you God's word. We're finishing chapter 16 in the Gospel of John, which I am truly excited about. Something that we've been pre pre preparing for all week. And we are moments away in the story of Christ in the Gospel of John. Moments away from Jesus uh, beginning his high priestly prayer in chapter 17. And then he will be betrayed. And we see his going to the cross. And we see his death, which is effective for his people in saving them. And then we enter into a time of where we see uh, the day between the death and the resurrection. A, great, uh, a time of, of great sorrow for God's people, for Jesus' disciples, those who, those who believed in him. And then we see his resurrection, of course, and... And about 40 days later, we see his ascension to the throne, his ascension to go back to heaven where he had been for all of eternity. And he continues to be there, waiting to return, to restore new heavens and a new earth for his people to dwell in for all of eternity, worshiping him. Before we get into the text of John 16, uh, I'd like to share with you just my my sincere thanks for all who have reached out to me and to my family, expressing their condolences and their prayers uh, with the loss of my mom last Saturday. I'd just like to share with you that, um, that your prayers and condolences have truly meant so much to my family and I, and they have sustained me. God has used it to continue to give me comfort. Uh, but it is a long, arduous process in which we grieve and mourn, um, especially parents, and especially in a way that is unexpected. So I appreciate you, and I appreciate your uh, all that you have done for uh, myself and my family. And please continue to pray, because it sure is a painful process, but I trust and rest in the work of Christ and am surrounded by His comfort. With that said, I would like to share with you a portion of Psalm 51 before we go to the Lord in prayer. So let's pray. The psalmist writes in Psalm 51, verses 1 and 2, he says, Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Heavenly Father, how grateful your people are that you do exactly what the psalmist asks. You have mercy on your people as a whole and individually as your steadfast love abounds in our hearts. And it's by that steadfast love that you redeem us by the blood of your Son Jesus, expressing your abundant mercy, blotting out our transgressions, clothing us, clothing us, with, clothing us with his righteousness. And you wash us thoroughly from our iniquity. You cleanse us from our sin. Heavenly Father, you have created a world. A world that displays your power and your strength. It displays your creativeness. And that all creation comes from you. That you are the source of, of all things, Father. And we ask that your creation would continue to point us to our love for you and your love for us. Though we live in this creation and it is fallen since the fall of man with Adam and Eve, we know that you have plans to restore this earth to all that you ever planned for, it, restoring it to a place in which we can worship you unadulterated, unaffected by sin and fallenness. Heavenly Father, in that new heavens and new earth, there will be no more death. It has been conquered by your Son, Jesus, and we thank you for your Son. We thank you for the redemptive work of Christ. We thank you that you have, you have given us the new birth, changing our hearts so that we might believe and love your goodness and begin to hate our sinfulness. Father, encourage us on this path of life that we might continue to shy away from our sin, turning away from it and putting it to death, putting it under the curse that Christ has put on it. And Father, may we dwell in his presence and real, realize each and every single day more of your love and his love 
the same love which we've been called to have towards one another and towards you. We thank you for your word, Father. We pray that your word right now, that it would spring to life, that it would reveal to us our need for you, create in us a thankfulness for you, and spur us on in this life of a Christian. May, may these words come from you and not from myself. May your Holy Spirit reveal to us your truth. We thank you. We love you. We pray this in your son's precious name. Amen. So as you turn in your Bibles, and I pray that you have a Bible with you, we are looking at John 16, verses 25 through 33. Again, this is the end of chapter 16, and we'll go through the high priestly prayer in chapter 17. And then we look at Jesus being uh, uh, handed over to uh, the authorities, and the authorities uh, question Jesus. The disciples disperse. He's delivered to be crucified. We see the crucifixion. Then we see Christ's death. We see that he is buried. We see that he is raised. This is what we have to keep in mind as we open up our text today, knowing that all things that Jesus is saying, this is essentially his last will and testament. These are the last things he has to say before he goes to the cross and dies a painful death, a humiliating death, a death that was that was reserved only for the worst of criminals. So let's let's look at the text. We'll go piece by piece here, but as we open it up, I want you to understand that Jesus reveals to us in this text that through his resurrection, he has defeated the world's efforts to destroy him and secures for his disciples peace with God, a peace that surpasses all understanding. You know, you think of of war and every soldier longs for peace when they are in the midst of war and as followers of Jesus we once were at war with God we were once at war with what he called good because all good uh, proceeds from or comes from God he is the creator of all things he is the one who says this is good this is not good and because we are sinful creatures by nature, we've been born into that. That we have been at war, that we have despised what God calls good. And because he has given us a new heart through his Holy Spirit, as we learned in John 3 so very long ago when we started in the Gospel of John we learn that our heart changes so that now our love is for what God calls good. And as we learn more about what God calls good, we long for those things that God loves and that he enjoys. And he enjoys seeing us live in creation in harmony with one another, in, in harmony with him. But this is an imperfect uh, life that we live and the perfection that we receive is from Christ so that even when we uh, seek to be obedient to God that it is slightly imperfect as much as it is because it comes from us but we know that there's no stench of imperfection before God because we have been saved by the perfect work of Christ so our best efforts although they they may smell to us and although they might be from a wrong heart sometimes, and, and maybe it's just not quite what God calls us to, that our life doesn't rest in our own work, but our life rests in the work of Christ. So, let's get to verses 25 through 28, and we're going to see here in verses 25 through 28 that God's love is given to those who have faith in Christ. Pretty simple, I think, but God's love has been given to those who have faith in Christ. So let's turn to verse 25. Jesus says, I have said these things to you in figures of speech. Now, I want you to understand this, that when Jesus is referring to figures of speech in the original language and in the context of, of the first century, he isn't necessarily uh, suggesting that he's speaking in what we commonly think of as figures of speech, right? A figure of speech could be a little colloquialism or a little saying that we might have, whether we grew up here in Johnston County or like for me, I grew up in Massachusetts. We have little sayings that we might say that illustrate a certain point. 
Um, in the original language, figures of speech actually points to the way in which Jesus was speaking. He wasn't speaking in specifics. He was speaking more in obscurity. So you think of this in the uh, resurrection, right? Jesus, when he talk, or excuse me, when Jesus talks about his crucifixion, he uh, speaks more broadly and doesn't speak necessarily about specifics. So we have the benefit on this side of the cross when Jesus says things about him being lifted up. We understand what that means because we see what happened. But the disciples live on the other side of the cross, so they don't know that Christ is going to be crucified on the cross. So when he says that I will be lifted up, now John often has double meaning, so he means lifted up on the cross and also means lifted up in the ascension. Jesus is using what they would refer to as a figure of speech. It's a bit obscure. It's a bit broad. He's lacking in the details, but the details would be filled out the next day after this. The details would be filled out of his painful death with the glory of God and, and the wrath of God poured out on Christ that day. So moving on, the hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, again obscurity, but will tell you plainly about the Father. He will give us specifics about God, the Father. In fact, we see that Jesus comes so that we might have the Father revealed to us. The, the full revelation of God is given to us in Christ. And Christ points to himself. He points to the Father. And the Father points to Christ. The Holy Spirit points to Christ. But Jesus here is reminding us that his intent, his purpose is to reveal God to humanity. In that day, verse 26, you will ask in my name. I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. Now, we do know that Jesus is our intercessor. He does pray for us. We're called to pray in his name, which we'll see here in a moment. And we saw in the text from last week in the previous set of verses. But he says, In that day you will ask in my name. And I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. Moving on, for the Father himself loves you. Because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. So the reason the Father loves you is that you have faith, that you believe in me, that you trust me, that all the things that I have revealed to you, everything that I have said, you believe. And because you believe, because you have this faith, God loves you. Now I'm reminded in Ephesians 2 that even that faith has been given to us from God so that no one may boast. His glory is found in his grace and his mercy. Verse 28, I came from the Father and came into the world, and now I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. So it's our faith in Christ that unites us to him. We're not united to Christ because we were raised in a family that followed Jesus. I mean, that certainly helps. It certainly helps to be in a family that will point you to Jesus. And I pray that you are, but I know for me, I was not in such a family. So we know that people can come to Christ even outside of being born into it, so to speak. No one's really born into Christ. You actually are born from above. You are born again. And we are united to Christ. We have this union with him that unites us to all fellow believers in this union is based on his work, and that work is applied to us because we have faith in him. God doesn't change. The doctrine of immutability means that God is unchanging. He hasn't changed from the beginning of the world to now. He will never change. He has always been and will always be. Many people look at the Old Testament and New Testament and see that they believe that it's two different gods, or they'll say, they, I like the God of the New Testament far more than I like the God of the Old Testament, who displays his wrath on Israel throughout history. And he displays his wrath on the people who have subjugated, or uh, been, uh, they have uh, not been kind to Israel. He displays his wrath on them. He destroys entire cities. He destroys entire nations. But understand this, that it's not God who changes, it is us as people who change. And not only that, our relationship 
to him changes over time. So his relationship to his people was founded on the law in the Old Testament. But now our relationship to God is found in his mercy and his grace as given to us through Christ. So God has not changed, but our relationship to him has. Moving on, verses 29 through 32. We see that prior to the resurrection, the disciples' faith lacks stability. So they've been united to Christ in by faith that has been given to them by God. And this is how God displays his love for them. He, he loves them because they have faith in his son. They believe in his son. They love his son. They've been kind to his son. It's actually, in fact, the, the, uh, it's on account of Christ that we've been saved. It's on account of Christ that we can have faith. It's on account of Christ that we've been given all things. And prior to the resurrection, the disciples' faith, it lacked stability. Lacked stability. Verse 29, his disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe. Jesus, or this is why we believe that you came from God. Verse 31, Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come. He's referring to his being handed over and his going to the cross. Indeed it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Stop there. Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Under what, what happens? We all know what comes uh, once, once the authorities come to arrest Jesus. Everybody scatters. Peter lops off someone's ear. He lops off a guard's ear. And Jesus restores the guy, heals him. Must have been an incredible experience from that guard. But we see that the disciples, as soon as they were under threat for arrest... They scattered. They left Jesus alone. Peter denies Jesus. Others likely denied Jesus. Hey, didn't you follow that Jesus guy? No, nah, no, nah, that must have been my neighbor. That must have been some other guy. Right? They start throwing people under the bus like at a crazy rate because they did not want to be associated with Jesus because it, they knew that it would cause them to get arrested and possibly suffer the same fate that he inevitably would. Jesus says this, yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. The disciples will be distressed over their own actions. They did not act appropriately in their own mind, and Jesus foresaw it. He told them. We'll see some encouragement here in a moment, but, but I'd like you to think of this. That make them any less of followers of Jesus because in that moment they rejected him. There was certainly some shame. There was certainly a, a, a distressing act in which they uh, looked to themselves and probably thought, Man, who, we've been with Jesus for three years. He told us that there would come a time where we would face trials and tribulation. He's been arrested. We know what his fate holds. And instead of his hour of need coming to him, we ran. We hid. We denied him. But here's the thing. If you think of a grapevine, you're at a vineyard. You have a grapevine. And there are other vines it could be. You plant this vine and it starts growing. But as the uh, vine dresser, the one who is the farmer growing these grapes, you look upon that vine you're not quite sure if this is a weed, if this is a, a type of vine that you want growing in your vineyard or not. The way you discern that is by looking to see what type of fruit it bears. Sometimes it's going to bear maybe one grape, a single grape. Maybe it's just, if, if the things aren't right, maybe there hasn't been enough 
uh, fertilizer. Maybe there hasn't been enough sunlight. Maybe there hasn't been enough water. Maybe there are weeds around it, things that are working against it growing to full fruition. Uh, maybe there are things around it that are distracting that vine from fully being what it is called to be, what it's been designed to be, but it does not make it any less of a grapevine. And what it might need is some encouragement. Maybe that's fertilizer. Maybe it might need some some water and some sunlight. These are natural things that are to be given to a vine so that it can fully mature and produce the fruit that is expected of it. But it doesn't make it any less of a grapevine if it's not producing fruit right away. Even if it has just that one grape that is covered and you can't really see it all that well. Such is the case with Jesus' disciples. Jesus told them that this is why God loves you, that you have faith in me. And he affirms that faith. He doesn't say that their, their faith is, is something that really doesn't exist. He affirms that they have that type of faith. It's kind of like that type of faith that we saw earlier in the gospel, a faith that Jesus describes as, as one that is based on signs. It's still a salvific faith. It's still a faith that sees them uh, know Jesus in an intimate way that they are saved. But it is a fickle type of faith. It is a faith that lacks stability. But Jesus promises us here in this next portion of, of text that as he has conquered the world, so will we because we have been united to him. So even in our lack of stability in faith, even when we are wavering, he promises that those who have been called by the Father and have been redeemed by his blood, that no matter what, he will see them in the last days and restore them. Let's look to verse 33. We see that Christ conquers the world's disobedience and makes his disciples partakers in his victory. Verse 33, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. You don't have peace in anything other than Christ. The peace that we understand to, to be in, in which we are no longer at war with God. That even in the midst of our disobedience, he has made us right to him on account of Christ. He says, in the world you will have tribulation. We know this. We've talked about this extensively. There will be trials. There will be difficult times. There will be times in which there are weeds around you strangling that vine, strangling those branches so that the fruitfulness might be lacking or might not come to full fruition. But he says, but take heart. I have overcome the world. I've overcome the world's disobedience. I've overcome... The war that has waged, I have destroyed death. I've overcome death. It has no sting anymore. It has no hold on you. You have the ability to, to see those weeds dissipate, to get rid of those things. You have the ability to grow in fruitfulness so that, man, I will be able to look upon you and show to the world, display in you my glory my faithfulness, my love, so that others will have that same type of fruit, so that they might love me, so that they might have a peace. I have overcome the world, Jesus says. The greatest sin of this world is its disobedience and lack of faith in God. It's lack of faith in Christ. He says, but I've overcome it. So that whoever puts their trust and love and faith in me shall have everlasting life. I've overcome the world, Jesus says. John Calvin says, If therefore we desire to be Christians, we must not seek exemption from the cross, but must be satisfied with the single or this single consideration, that fighting under the banner of Christ, we are beyond all danger, even in the midst of the combat. So as we go to war with the things around us, as we face the trials and tribulations of our faith, as, as we might feel shaken, maybe someone comes to us with, with some sort of what they think is a fact or some sort of challenge to our logical thinking. Maybe they come to us and, and we don't fully understand what they might say. Maybe we don't know the scriptures as well as we hope to. Maybe 
Maybe we haven't fully trusted in the Lord in all things in our lives. Maybe others, and this is a great one. This is a great thing that people do. They will tell you about your sinfulness. They will remind you of the life that you once lived and say, how could you be a follower of Jesus when you've done this? Well, Paul uh, murdered people. Um, he, he, think of this on your resume. If, if Paul was to apply to be your pastor and you realize that he was once a persecutor of Christians, uh, most people would say, ah, we'll move on to the next guy. I'm guilty of that too sometimes, but we must be reminded that Christ has called us to follow him. And that in following him, he calls us to a life of tribulation, of trial. And as such, he tells us that no matter what, in the midst of that war that you will face here on earth, you will come through it with my perfection, with my love, with my glory, because I have overcome the world and you are united to me. By what? By faith in Him. May God bless you. May He keep you. May He sustain you. And through all the trials and tribulations that you find yourself in, may you look towards Christ and His perfect work in you. It's in His name I pray. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week.